In the chemistry major, you'll take classes that focus on specific branches of chemistry, which I'll go into shortly, but what you might not expect is that you'll take a lot of math, physics, and some biology courses. There's especially more math and even calculus used than you would assume from a high school chem class. Chemistry has a fair amount of memorization associated with it, like biology does, but this major's hallmark is problem solving. For example, in a general chemistry class, you might be asked what will be the new pressure of a gas in a fixed container if you raise the temperature from 273 Kelvin to 350 Kelvin. You may know how to solve this because it just involves the ideal gas law and some basic algebra, but it's definitely not just a memorization problem. As a chem major, you'll take general chemistry, organic chemistry, and physical chemistry, or as you'll hear them called, gen chem, o chem, and pchem. These are really the bulk of your classes, and each take about a year to complete. On top of these, chem majors will have to take about a year of physics and a year and a half of calculus, which is basically identical to what engineers have to do as well, which is why I emphasized how much math and problem solving there is. Gen Chem comes first and is where you'll learn the basics but will go into more depth than you might have learned in high school chemistry. You'll learn the periodic table, how to mathematically balance chemical equations, the evolution of how the atom was understood, and the ideal gas law, and more. You'll also learn how battery cells work and use equations to predict their energy. In the lab, you may have to predict the amount of product you will have at the end of a combustion reaction, or you might be asked to create a battery cell which will apply your knowledge of ions, oxidation, and reduction reaction. These labs are going to get you familiar with all the equipment you would need to use as a chemist. In OCHEM, you'll have to learn and memorize lots of different skeletal structures which give detail to the bonding of a molecule, like single or double bonds that exist in the compound. You'll also learn how various compounds can be changed, so given a skeletal structure, you'd be asked if something is added to it, what will the new compound be? and this can be used to our advantage to manipulate compounds into something useful like medicine. You'll learn what many different commonly known nutrition compounds are made of, like protein, amino acids, carbs, and vitamins. In lab, you may be asked to create a product given an initial starting material and through various organic chemistry mechanisms arrive at a final product. You will be asked to predict the amount of product you will end up with, and you'll also learn that the more steps in a procedure, the more error you will have built into the experiment. Then PCHEM is where the high level math comes in. You will probably be required to use calculus throughout these classes. You will learn the proofs behind concepts taught in GenChem, and why most of these concepts were grossly oversimplified to what actually happens. You'll even get into quantum mechanics, which is a big physics topic, but you'll see how it applies to chemistry. Quantum mechanics is essentially the physics of how things move and behave on a very small scale, like electrons, atoms, and photons, or light. One example would be infrared spectroscopy. This is a technique where we can shine infrared light on a chemical to determine what it is. Now we can't see infrared light, which is what some remote controls use to turn on your TV. But using a device called an infrared spectrometer, we can analyze the spectrum of light that comes off, which tells us which wavelengths are most present in the light. So essentially, depending on how the graph looks and where the maximum points are, we can tell what the chemical is. If you're a chemistry student interested in biotechnology, drug design, or the food industry, one course you are likely to enjoy is biochemistry or biochemical principles, depending on what your school calls it. In this class, we will use advanced chemistry and mathematical concepts to study biological organisms and the cellular constituents such as proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and membranes. In this course, you will learn their structures and the metabolic processes associated with them. For example, for carbohydrates, you will go into great detail on glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. For lipids, one metabolic process you will study is beta oxidation, and for proteins or amino acids, you will not only study protein synthesis, but you will also study protein's versatility and function in biological organisms. This class will be challenging, most will require math for post-lab calculations, and some schools might even require you to develop a little bit of computer coding skills to program various functions for lab calculations. One thing you are sure to practice in the lab is protein purification given a starting sample. Protein purification is done so that you can run various experiments on the sample and study the many processes and functions of protein. Next, let's talk about quantitative analysis, which is another class you'll take. Simply put, quantitative analysis is determining how much of a given component is present in a sample. It may be expressed in mass, 
concentration, or relative abundance of one or all components. In general chemistry and many of your other chemistry courses, you will have spent a lot of time balancing equations and be asked to solve for how much product can be made given a known starting material. In this class, you go deeper in theory about chemical equilibrium problems and apply this theory in lab to analytical problems. There are many quantitative analysis techniques, but one example you may be familiar with is an acid-base titration. In this technique, you'd be able to determine the concentration of, let's say, an acid by neutralizing it with a base of a known concentration. Quantitative is important because it will help you predict how much product to expect and determine your actual yield. Quantitative analysis is used in a wide range of scientific industries such as agrochemical companies, biotechnology, food and drug companies, hospital laboratories, chemical slash polymer manufacturers, and many more. For example, analytical chemists frequently use quantitative analysis in the formulation and testing of foods and drugs because it is used to measure nutrient levels and provide an accurate dose. Another example is a medical lab tech who would use tests to determine the amount of various constituents of blood, such as amount of red blood cells, blood cholesterol levels, or the amount of protein excreted in urine. Two common job titles that people who have PhDs typically hold are analytical chemists and chemists. Although it might be possible to find some senior level analytical chemist or chemist positions without a PhD, most jobs will require a PhD. As of 2016, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that there were 86,660 chemists in the workforce with a mean annual wage of $80,020 a year and expected employment growth of 2.3%. One thing to note is that this number only accounts for chemists who specifically have chemist in their job title. One huge plus about becoming an analytical chemist or a chemist is that they can find work in a wide range of scientific industries. A list of industries that employ different types of chemists include chemical or forensic analysis, like for criminal or civil investigations, process development, product validation, quality control, or toxicology, which is the study of biological effects and safety of drugs and other chemicals. And of course, there's many more industries and fields of chemistry you can go into. Now earlier I mentioned that analysts frequently use quantitative analysis to measure the amount of a given constituent and in these careers they would use various quantitative analysis techniques on a daily basis. In conjunction with quantitative analysis, chemists use qualitative analysis to determine the different types of constituents in a sample. To put it simply, if you have an unknown sample, you use qualitative techniques to determine which compounds are present and quantitative techniques to determine how much of those compounds are present. If math and science really excites you, but you would prefer not to work in a lab, chemistry is a great major to prepare yourself to be a doctor, pharmacist, nurse, or dentist, because this major would satisfy most of your pre-health requirements and give four years of in-depth problem-solving practice. Now, some specific chemistry jobs would include being an agrochemist, biochemist, inorganic chemist, and many more. For example, an agrochemist would combine their chemistry and biochemistry knowledge to improve agricultural practices like improved crop production or making the process of taking raw goods and turning them into consumable foods and beverages. Inorganic chemistry is essentially looking at compounds that don't have a carbon-hydrogen bond. This knowledge can be used in mining, geosciences, and the production of semiconductors like the ones used in your computers and cell phones. If you think designing drugs for pharmaceutical companies to help people recover from illness sounds interesting, then pursuing a career as a biochemist might be a great career for you. As a biochemist, you would use advanced problem-solving skills to develop molecules that would interact with the body and help cure or treat disease. Now, although some of these may interest you, entry-level chemistry jobs are often not incredibly exciting because fresh out of school with just a bachelor's degree, you are limited in your knowledge and skill sets. Jobs may involve simply following procedures created by a superior, like adding a certain amount of a chemical to another solution, but won't be very academically challenging. Of course, this may not always be true, but is a very common occurrence for those with bachelor's degrees. So obtaining further education is basically required for majors like chemistry, biochemistry, or biology if you want to go more into the design or research and development kind of work. I've provided a link to the American Chemical Society careers page down below, which has huge lists and definitions of chemistry careers, and if you look around, you'll notice something. If you go to the toxicology page, on the right it says that 50% of toxicologists have a PhD, 25% have a master's, and 25% have a bachelor's. 
If you go to, let's say, nuclear chemistry, they say on the right that technicians in the field require a bachelor's degree and that research or professional staff require a PhD. And whether you look at medicinal chemists, crystallography, nanochemistry, and so on, they all say something similar, such that technicians are the ones with a bachelor's, but to do the research and design work, you usually need a master's and quite often a PhD. So make sure to take note on that. If you guys like this video, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.